Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. That's good. All right. Well, I come to you today with black rimmed eyeglasses with short and short wavy silver hair. I join you from Chicago, the traditional homelands of the people of the Council of Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Potawatomi, Dawa, as well as the Menominee, Miami, and Ho-Chunk nations. Located at the intersection of several great waterways, the land was naturally a site of trade, travel, gathering, and healing for more than a dozen other native tribes. And it is still home to over 100,000 tribal members in the state of Illinois. So it's my pleasure to be here. And I wanna start by saying we started off in a very good way this week with a generous welcome from the mighty team of organizers for this conference. So as one of many thank yous and also um, congratulations, Alex, Emily, Martina, and Sarah, um, my hat's off to you, thank you. Tech Focus 4, 4, it's a series spanning years. So I would be remiss if I didn't shout out, make a shout out to Christina Fronert, to Agata Yarchik, to Mona Jimenez, to Joanna Phillips, and I am sure there are many more EMG stewards to thank over the last years. You've made a nexus, a platform for open discussion and debate. It's productive in one way for keeping up with the rapid fire technological advances in the sector, but it's productive in another because of the way that it has, has made a trusted space to think, to rethink, and to imagine just what conservation is and what it can be. As one of the tech archeology span hosts back in the day, I tip my hat to an even earlier pioneering cohort. To this very day, lessons learned in that gathering sit right here on my shoulder and they remind all of us of the change that has happened. Artist Gary Hill evoked death rituals for artworks as sanctioned practice, a provocation that I'm pretty sure hasn't actualized, but one that really faced the limitations of our control in preservation. The artist Dara Birnbaum implored us when, I, when I'm running a marathon, meaning her art installations, don't interrupt me in the 25th mile to ask me about what I'm gonna do next time. Advice like that led us to lift up the oral record as a bona fide research method and to meet people and artists on their terms where they are instead of dictating those terms from the institution. The artist James Coleman made it very clear that the life of his slide-based works is reliant on the medium. For James and for us, it has meant fortifying the pillars of our professional, our traditional practices by sustaining a bygone commercial medium. Now I'm gonna um, confess that I resisted writing remarks in advance of this week. And it was simply because I wanted to listen first and then reflect. What a rousing few days. We have been treated to big challenges and, and exciting thinkers. And I'd love to share ever so briefly takeaways from each of our speakers to recap, but also to acknowledge and honor their work. Day one was all about technological table setting. The school of seeing officially became the school of seeing and touching. I wonder how many other senses will be incorporated into our best work in coming years. Cybernetic innovators look to the natural world around us for inspiration. Age-old wisdom and evolutionary smarts have us looking anew at the exquisite interconnectedness and balance we must keep with the natural world. Has conservation adapted its fundamental foundations to respond to this moment? Lisa Dimitrios and Daniel Ostroff kicked off the conference by opening a window, by letting fresh air into the room, by taking us into the minds and practice of Charles and Ray Eames, into a world of the iterative where failure was recast as misconception. How is on art conservation productively iterative in this response? James Weaver brought us to a world of ammonites, mother of pearl, sharks, for design inspiration. He was asked to reflect on the nature of collaboration and called out a mistake, that being to work too closely within your discipline. 
it ends up in his estimation all too often in a competition. Working among people with vastly different backgrounds leads to new ways of solving problems. It made me think of Caroline Jones and our historian at MIT. Um, I, I like I like Caroline's work very, very much. And I recommend to you a 38 minute audio reflection entitled A Common Sense. Um, I'm gonna hit, I think I wanna hit this into the chat, hold on. Is it there? I think it is. Um, it's a completely enjoyable listen in which she wonders how we will participate in the cultural evolution of the species. Our virtual tech focus space has been replete with high tech chops. Mark Heller's true superpower has always been speaking clearly and plainly across expert disciplines. And I think that in his explanation of G-code, we might have seen him communicating between expert machines. Moreover, in Daniel Lutolf, who took us through intricacies of 3D printing workflows and post-production processing, I believe we met Mark's Swiss cousin. Nick Lee, brought production of filament extrusion or vat resin printing or powder bed infusion to my awareness as, as usable names. He also demonstrated the ways that the built object is not one in the same with the designed object. Moreover, he showed us how innovations in software and hardware jockey for position. They chase and then they supersede each other to define what is possible. Charlotte Eng outlined the range of materials deployed in 3D printing, providing vivid examples of polymeric, composite, and inorganic materials in use today. Day two was about keeping. The pivot demonstrated the resourcefulness, agility, creativity, and hard work of you. You who maneuver within the existing scaffolds of learning we call museums, libraries, and archives. Two questions. At what point do we adjust the scaffolds? And if we do, what is conservation's role in that work? Paola Antonelli treated us to a flyover of her digital forays, and I still find it hard to imagine that MoMA's first website was built for $315. She talked about change in her curatorial life, a curatorial life happening now in all dimensions. That is an invitation an invitation to see artists and artworks in all dimensions, see our public with greater dimensionality. And I wonder how this conference will bring greater dimensionality to, con to conservation. Her word, trouble, albeit good trouble, reminded me of Charles and Ray Eames, supplanting the word failure with misconception. I wonder what word we can choose to supplant trouble. In her inimitable way, Emily Hamilton put her finger on the nub of a problem. The ethics of refabrication asks us to think about what collections do, perhaps what we allow them to do. To inspire creative ingenuity in our field, we need only to look at those who design in this field we've been discussing this week. Maybe art museums need to start collecting the science behind these 3D prints. Srija Quadrovi Quintana brought us into the world of copyright law in the US. And as I listened to Sriva, I was remembering Jessica Walther's question to Paolo Antonelli, is anything uncollectible? Interestingly, Paolo, in Paolo's opinion, it was the proprietary restrictions that, that make something uncollectible. Then we heard from Virginia San Fratello. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, immediately following Virginia's presentation, I went to Forest and purchased those incredible 3D creations for friends and families this holiday season. Rethinking building from the bottom up, whether salt, bugs, spices, or discarded rubber tires, rethinking building using the materials around us, those are rich outcomes of experimentation and play. Sarah Barak and Jessica Walthew then treated us to the mechanisms of the museum devoted to these processes of design, working with Virginia to surrender to the discomfort of works like Furry Curry. Sarah talked about bringing order to what seems cha seemed chaotic. There's a word chaotic that has been around since 2017 to describe an organization that harmoniously combines elements of both chaos and order without letting either one dominate. 
I wonder if that new space Sarah and Jessica described as supplemental acquisitions has opened the door to experimentation and play. In their discussion of cost of living, um, Aleda by Josh Klein, Margot Delido and Savannah Campbell asked how, perhaps if, museums are willing participants in the process of change. The uncertainty that goes along with that question lies at the root of this whole conference. Now, if day one was about table setting, I'm gonna call out day three as being about the meal. We sampled every course and now we lean back in our chairs to talk. Shirley Tse in Negotiated Differences aims to let differences face off in pursuit of negotiation, the old and the new, the now and the unknown future, the unique and the reproducible, the functional and the non-functional, the handmade and the ready-made. She reminds us of one of art's great gifts and that is to see the world anew. If we think about it, attending to those works can reflexively inspire and guide us to see our work anew. Thank you to Olivia Chow, Alessandra Guaraccio, and Aga Vialonka for dialing in from the middle of the night in Hong Kong just as M Plus prepares to open. It punctuates the perpetual process of cultural stewardship. It's always going on somewhere. Struck by the parentheses that existed in their title, the grammatical tool that, that a parentheses is for inserting an afterthought in what would be a complete idea without it, the impossible futures of Shirley Tse's work. Impossible, M in parentheses. It reminded me of a couple of other titles. A panel discussion that I participated in in Madrid many, many years ago, entitled Collecting the previously uncollectible. Your, our entanglements, the why in parentheses, is an essay written by Madeline Grinstein about Olafur Eliasson's artistic practice. The conditionality of language points to the ever-present messiness of human knowledge that flows from the artist to the artwork, to the gallery, to the museum, to our publics, and then all the way back again. How does, our, how does our work identify with this game of telephone and also with the debates of our time? Tobias Klein intri um, intrigued me by the possibilities of supplanting the word error with lucky accident. The idea is not known to us in human history, but thank you, Tobias, for not only articulating a lovely new term to me that is digital craftsmanship, but also demonstrating it in your work. Caroline Kuhn, Matt Kalisha's Zotrope Garden of Unearthly Delights was such an apt visual for your talk. The immense value of an the analytical research units like UCL's Inst Institute for Sustainable Heritage with resources that produ produce data about the vast range of plastic formulations and 3D printing. These units probe and answer questions encountered across the, world, the globe. How will this unit's work be coordinated internationally? What questions will guide these efforts? Sincere thanks to Peter Alexic for dropping in throughout the conference to share all your always thoughtful working processes. When Peter joined Megan Randall to discuss Toba Auerbach's alter engine, specifically reprinting 40 mesh, the hiccups they encounter could seem daunting. Tuba Arbuck's Alter Engine illustrates the ongoing need for the skill sets we currently hold. With the introduction of new rhythms of work and labor in the machine of the museum. The reminder here, conservation, the work that we do is part of something much larger. Sarah Scatora took us into the challenges of wearable 3D prints. And for me, it recalled Nick's, Nick Lee's talk and the divide between an object's design and its construction. It also reminded me of an entire field of study in architecture, experimental design, ex fantastical structures of architects like Lebius Woods, um, all of that fascinating. And thank you, Sarah, for bringing us into this realm of fashion. 
The opening paragraph of something I wrote in 2016 called In the Wings goes like this. Art sparks ideas and emotions that are at one with everyday encounters in life. It amuses, confounds, angers, seduces, bores, excites, frustrates, and delights. There are countless roles and practices for those faithful to the enterprise of art making, stewardship, scholarship, and interpretation. An ever expanding array of materials and new methods of production prompt corollary streams of discourse and exchange, all unfolding at a dizzying pace. Meanwhile, cultural institutions move slowly. And while it is unlikely that anyone will topple over from the force of the new, we are obliged to engage with these strong currents and to sway with the push and pull of perpetual transition. We balance what lies ahead with what has come before. Equal in, equilibrium exists in between. Now, I can't help but read this five years later and ask myself, which parts remain too, true? And what reads already outdated? We face wicked problems. A wicked problem is a term popularized in 1992 by Professor Richard Buchanan. It refers to the extremely thorny social and cultural problem that is hard precisely because of the number of people who are involved. Because one wicked problem is entangled with others. Because of incomplete information. And because addressing these problems is costly. Sound familiar? Climate change, poverty, education are all described as wicked. For heritage workers to be at the table as solutionaries, our approach must take the point of view that this is an era in which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment. What challenges do we face in adopting this new perspective in our field? I, I won't answer this question today, but I will say, that we have been in the company this week of remarkable inspiration. So how will we respond? Caroline Jones wonders too, how will we participate in the cultural evolution of the species? As humans, we take into account the apparatus of our bodies, our small primate brains that limit our memory to our lifespan. And every day we're up against an inherited predisposition to individualism. Caroline looks to shifts in science and technology. Indeed, the likes of people who have joined us here this week, who are engaged in the study of vast natural life forms from which we, we will and we can learn. Jones played a rhetorical game with two artists working in biology in which he asked them to imagine their embodied superpower. One wanted the tentacles of an octopus. Another wanted the echolocation or the sonar sensors of a bat. For Carolyn, she said this, I want the temporal sensibility of the sequoia. I want to know what it would be like to have all of your offspring be clones, to potentially live a thousand or more years. What would that be like? What kind of consciousness would you have of the planet as something you were a part of? Amidst gobsmacking complexity, our field exists to help people make meaning in their lives. As you go about your extraordinary work in conservation, attending to the details of 3D printed objects, the people who made them and the stories behind their work, remember this trouble and remember the iterative re-collaborations of our mindset that will connect our heritage work even more to the big questions of humanity. This cohort, can be the one to model adapted conservation approaches because the work, 3D prints themselves require it. This cohort has the potential to bring far reaching impact to the field that we hold very, very dear. Thank you very much.